Next, from Springfield, Eric Medeer, the former chief legal counsel for Senate President John Cullerton, addresses an audience of the State University's Annuitants Association about the legal challenges to pension reform. This runs about 50 minutes. Thank you, Thank you for that introduction. Can you all hear me? Okay. I had asked Linda to make sure that you guys would eat first, so if you didn't like what I had to say, there would be less food for you to throw at me with my remarks. So, uh, good afternoon, and really thank you for the opportunity to talk about my favorite issue of public pensions, and the last time I was here was in June of 2011, and that, at that point I had published an, or had written an article for the Senate President about the Illinois Constitution's public pension clause and its scope, and there had been a lot of debate at that time whether or not the Illinois Pension Clause would allow the General Assembly to make unilateral cuts in pension benefits. And at that time, there was a group uh, with um, the Commercial Club of Chicago that had put out a position paper that pension benefits could be unilaterally cut. And then there was an, uh, some back and forth with a lawyer uh, Gino DeVito, a former Illinois appellate court justice, who said, well, ne that's not correct. I was given the charge by the Senate president to, to look at both perspectives and also really to do a comprehensive analysis of the pension clause. And the conclusion I drew at that time, back in March of 2011, was that pension benefits based on the pension clause, its plain language, its history, the decisions that are uh, out there at that time and in March of 2011 is that pension benefits were absolutely protected and that the General Assembly lacked the power to unilaterally cut benefits. Uh, and that has really sort of been my, the narrative and, and viewpoint that I've had uh, since that time. And um, as you know and we'll get into, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court has issued in the last year uh, really three decisions and four decisions in the last couple years on the scope of the pension clause and the conclusion drawn is that pension benefits indeed are absolutely protected and are immune from unilateral changes from made by the General Assembly. Um, but today what I would like to talk about are, well, what are our options going forward? This issue of public pension reform, given the fiscal conditions of the state, is not going to go away. The fact that there has been some success in the courts recently from unilateral attempts by the legislature to change benefits does no way diminish the fact that attempts and thoughts will still be put forth to try and cut benefits, but in a way that will square with the pension clause. And candidly speaking, there are options that are available that can result in benefit cuts that would be consistent with the pension clause of the Constitution. And I'd like to talk about those today. So as I'll explain, while the pension clause protects pension benefits from adverse unilateral changes, Pension benefits can be changed through contract principles, offer, consideration, and acceptance. There can be the use of contract principles to obtain changes in benefits that will result in savings to the state. And to that end, I'll talk about it some more. The Senate pr President, John Cullerton, my former boss, he has one viable approach that could result in savings and square, in my view, with the pension clause. Other types of uh, avenues that could be pursued more recently, based on the Illinois Supreme Court decisions, is the use of collective bargaining, where the unions in the public sector can collectively bargain modifications in current pension benefits for the active employees that are members of the union. But one thing I'd like to point out, and, and I'll detail as well, is that attempts to amend the Illinois Constitution 
to allow the legislature to unilaterally cut benefits or legislation to allow municipalities to enter bankruptcy to unilaterally discharge benefits. Those are not legally viable options. So let's have our discussion begin really with the recent court decisions that have come out. As you know, and SUAA was a participant as a plaintiff, in May of 2005, the Illinois Supreme Court issued its decision dealing with Senate Bill 1. That was the 2013 pension reform bill that uh, unilaterally cut pension benefits, the big benefit of which was the 3% compounded COLA rate that actives and retirees would receive in retirement. This decision dealt with the issue of whether the General Assembly retains some kind of so-called police power to unilaterally cut pension benefits if it provides a good reason and there's some sense of economic necessity that's been determined by the General Assembly. And the result of this litigation from the Illinois Supreme Court is that the pension clause is not subject to a so-called police powers exception. While this police powers exception exists and is understood to exist with uh, the U.S. Constitution's contract clause, it does not equally apply to the pension clause. The Illinois Supreme Court, based on the plain language, the history of the pension clause and its prior decisions made it abundantly clear that there is no so-called police power exception that the General Assembly can invoke and therefore use as a way to unilaterally cut benefits. Um, one point that I found significant from this decision is that a large part of the court's analysis and narrative to support its conclusion is the fact that the state has historically underfunded the public pension systems of this state and in a way utilized pension funding uh, and diverted funding that would otherwise go to the pension systems in sort of a pro proverbial credit card way as a means in which to avoid tax increases, service cuts, or both. Um, now, you know, I, I, because of the fact that Senate Bill 1 unilaterally cut benefits, you know, it, it was my view that the outcome of this, uh, this court decision was really sort of preordained. Um, and there were, even with that in mind and a, a, sort of a lack of surprise on my part of what the outcome would be, there were some things in the decision that I was surprised by. The first was that the decision was unanimous. Another point was that the court really forcefully reaffirmed the rule of law and that we are a nation or, in a, or a state of law. We are a, not a state of men and women only, but what makes us exceptional is we have constitutions and we follow the constitutions because that is how our society is structured, is to know what the guardrails are, if you will, on the roadway and be able to contain politics within those guardrails. Um, another point is that uh, I felt, I, I suppose, a little bit gratified as they did point out in the opinion that uh, pension underfunding has existed in this state going back to 1917. And this is something that uh, I had pointed out in an article back in uh, September of 2014. But the court's decision, the Senate Bill 1 decision from last May, I think really gives us some clear guideposts as we move forward about what can be done. And in my view, I think that the court's decision gave a uh, green light of sorts to the use of contract principles to try and get benefit reductions and save the state money and hopefully mitigate this problem and allow us to move on to other serious fiscal challenges that the state has. So as a practical matter, what did we get out of the pension 
clause, uh, the, the Senate Bill 1 decision about the pension clause. The first, of course, that I mentioned is that the General Assembly lacks the power to unilaterally cut benefits. That's because the pension clause safeguards the benefits that are in place at the time a person joins the pension system. It also safeguards the benefits that are added while you are working. And you, if you continue to work after those benefits become law, those benefits are also protected because of you continuing to work. You've essentially offered further consideration uh, in, in exchange for getting that benefit increase. This, uh, the third point is that while the pension clause does not require that pensions be funded at a certain funding level, in that the pension system has to be 90% funded or 50% funded. It, in a way, it's, I don't want to say almost Ill, uh, legally irrelevant. It does require that pension benefits be paid when they become due. So the political issue is how are we going to fund pension benefits? Are we going to think of college? You are all in some way associated with college. Parents will pay for college either on a pay-as-you-go basis and pay when the bill comes, the tuition bill arrives in the mail, or they'll pre-fund that education through some kind of savings that they've stored up over years, or probably in reality some combination of the two. So the, the court basically said, you're on the hook to pay these pension benefits when they become due, but you have flexibility to determine whether you're going to pre-fund it or you're going to pay as you go. Um, finally, the final point is, you know, while the clause bars unilateral changes, you can use contract principles to get pension benefit changes and reductions. This then ties into the most recent case from the Illinois Supreme Court, and that was the decision issued in March of this year dealing with the Chicago Pension Reform Bill. In March, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court issued its decision in validating that legislation, which was very similar to Senate Bill 1, and it dealt with um, participants in two of the Chicago uh, retirement systems, the municipal and laborers' employees' uh, annuity funds. And the pension reform bill for these two, two Chicago systems also unilaterally cut the COLA rate that you would receive in retirement, not only for the active employees, but also for the retirees. Um, given the similarities of that pension reform bill with what was previously invalidated, the court found that the changes that were made were unilateral changes and they were unconstitutional because they violated the pension clause. Um, now, what's interesting about the uh, litigation for the Chicago Pension Reform Bill is that initially the city of Chicago tried to use the same police powers theory that the state tried to use for the state reform bill. But while that litigation was going on, the Illinois Supreme Court issued its Senate Bill 1 decision. So the city of Chicago realized that that particular argument or defense was no longer valid. So they came up with two other arguments to try and uphold that legislation. And both of these arguments were not persuasive uh, to the trial court judge in Cook County, and nor were they ultimately um, persuasive to the Illinois Supreme Court. The first argument that the city had is that they claimed that the bill that was passed uh, was constitutional because it provided tier one uh, participant, participants in these two systems with some kind of net benefit. And the net benefit was that the city is not obligated to um, fund these local pension systems if they go broke. And by this legislation, what the city has agreed to do is it will now statutorily be obligated to fund these systems on an actuarial basis. And 
because we are now going to fund these systems, the trade-off of a lower COLA results in the fact that rather than you getting nothing if the pension system here for these two local systems go broke, uh, but you'll get a net benefit because you at least will get paid some kind of benefits, albeit at a lower rate. And um, really the city's argument was premised on a 1963 statute that obviously predated the 1970 Constitution. Uh, a, a provision that said, if these local pension systems go broke, you're out of luck. If there's no money in it, there's no obligation for the city to step in and continue to, to pay benefits. Um, the Illinois Supreme Court identified really three fatal flaws with the city's argument and this net benefit, net benefit theory. First, it said that the new statutory funding schedule was just that. It was a statutory funding schedule that the legislature could come in and change at any time. So if the, the schedule said you needed to achieve 90% funding by the year 2055, it can change it and say, well, it needs to be 80% funded. You know, and it, it could just continue to change the funding schedule where there really wasn't any certainty that the pension systems that this and these two local funds would get some kind of sound and stable funding. It really was sort of illusory because statutes like anything else, uh, or any other statute could be changed at any time. Uh, the second or a point that the court made was that the pension clause itself required the city as the local employer to ultimately make pension payments should one of these two pension funds go broke. So this argument that the statute from 1963 somehow absolved the cities from having to step up and pay pensions should those local pension funds go broke did not wash. It was the pension clause itself that trumped and made this 1963 provision no longer operative. Uh, it was the city ultimately that would need to come up with the money if these local systems uh, were insolvent. Um, so these were really the two arguments and, and, and the third of which is that because of, and I shared it, is that because the pension clause came after this 1963 provision, a constitutional provision will always trump the, the effect or the legal effect of a prior statute. Um, the second argument that the city tried to use to defend its pension reform bill was that this legislation really represented a bargained exchange between the unions and the city. And it needed to be recognized as such, and it was a trade-off. And the city pointed to the fact that for about two years it had been working with the 31 labor unions that comprised uh, the, the participants in these two local pension funds, and that 28 of the 31 unions had agreed to these benefit cuts with the city, and so given contract principles being available as a means to cut pension benefits, the court should uphold this legislation as really a, a product of some kind of contractual exchange between the unions and the city of Chicago. Now, the court rejected this argument because it found that what had happened here is you had a piece of legislation that was developed like really any other piece of legislation. You had different stakeholders who got together with other stakeholders and they worked out legislation and then they came to Springfield to pass a bill. But what had not been done with this legislation is that it was not the product of collective bargaining between these 28 unions and the city of Chicago. And so it really, uh, as a basic position of contract law, is that the union leaders who had worked out this deal really didn't have the authority to bind their members 
to the agreement itself and what was reflected in the legislation. And that's because they were not acting in a collective bargaining capacity. They had not used the collective bargaining process to completion where the agreement would have been put on the table, memorialized in a collective bargaining agreement, and had some kind of ratification vote. None of those steps were taken. Above and beyond that, you still had non-union employees who were also bound by this legislation. And you also had uh, three of the uh, unions who did not agree with the legislation and who actually opposed the legislation who were also bound by it. So just in terms of basic contract principles, the, you had a failure of the fact that the unions that were entering into this agreement really didn't have the authority to bind their members in the first place, nor did they have the power to bind retirees or the members of other unions that were opposed to the legislation. But what was very clear from the court's decision is that it made its prior decisions um, really, um, in my view, um, clear that you can use contract principles to cut benefits, but you have to use those principles in a legitimate way. And it also indicated you can utilize the collective bargaining process and the unions, if they are acting in the collective bargaining process, can cut benefits. But it would have to be through the collective bar bargaining process if that's what the union is looking to do. Uh, separate apart, you do have just collective uh, contract principles being able to be used to cut benefits. So this, this leads us to really, where do we go from here? And in uh, my view, uh, in light of the Senate, the, the Senate Bill 1 decision and the City of Chicago decision uh, that came down recently, uh, there are really three options that we have. And the first option is that the General Assembly can pursue the contractual approach that was outlined by Senate President Cullerton to obtain benefit cuts in a way that really squares with the pension clause. And this was really put out there back in 2012 or 2013 as Senate Bill 2404. And the heart of the proposal really is something that is permissible today. So well, what is that proposal? Under this proposal, Tier 1 employees would have the choice of either giving up their 3% compounded COLA rate for a lower COLA rate, maybe a 3% simple, maybe the Tier 2 COLA rate, or just keeping the current COLA that they have. If they agree to give up their compounded COLA, then the state would agree to never offer future raises on a non-pensionable basis. If folks do not want this deal, that's fine. They can reject it, and they will obviously keep their 3% compounded COLA when they retire, but the state would only offer future raises to those folks on a non-pensionable basis. Either way, based on the choice, there are negative consequences that the state will be saving money. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that future raises are not something that a public employer has to offer on an unconditional basis. That means Let's take an example of a person who's making 50,000 a year today. The state, as it has in the past, can give raises, a $5,000 raise with no strings attached. So your salary goes from 50,000 to 55,000. Not only is that $5,000 extra in your pocket for today, but it also increases your final average pensionable salary down the road. And that's because the employer has offered you the raise with no strings attached to it. Based on New York court decisions, and again, our pension clause is based on the 1938 New York pension clause, based on decisions from that state, 
the public employer has the right. It has not used this right, but it has the right to offer future raises under the condition that if you accept them, they'll count as money in your pocket, but they won't count towards your pension when you retire. So the heart of this proposal the Senate President has is if you're at 50,000 and you take the deal, you're gonna to agree to take a lower COLA. And then if you get raises that take your salary from 50,000 to 75,000, those raises are gonna to count toward your pension. But you've agreed to take a lower COLA in retirement. If you decide, I'm near the end of my uh, career in state government, I'm not looking at getting future raises in the next couple of years anyways. I'm at 50,000. Maybe I do get a couple more raises that brings me up to $10,000 uh, $10, more where you're going from 50,000 to 60. Your pension will be based on 50,000, not the $60,000 level. And you will get your 3% compounded COLA based on that $50,000 level. Now, the there was a more recent decision that was uh, handed down by the Illinois Supreme Court in May. That dealt with um, the CTA. It was Matthews versus the Chicago Transit Authority. And that decision really, once again, reiterated that contract principles can be used to reduce and change pension benefits, as well as the fact that the unions can, through collective bargaining, um, modify the benefits of its active members through the collective bargaining process. So simply put, the notion that pension benefits are cast in stone and they cannot be changed under any circumstances is not correct. Um, now aside from using a contract approach to reduce benefits, there are some other things that the state can consider as well. One of which would be to change the current funding schedule that we have today. We are in all uh, intents and purposes still under the uh, 1995 funding plan that has us seeking to achieve 90% funding by the year 2045. We could re that uh, schedule to where we're gonna try and have 80% um, funding maybe in 2055. And rather than having funding that looks like the, the American Eagle roller coaster ride, which is what we have today, we can try and flatten out our payments much like you would for your mortgage where you're paying a flat amount every year. They call that a level dollar approach to funding pensions. Uh, one concern with that is in order to get on a level dollar funding, we would have to pay more into the pension system than we're paying currently. So we sort of have a fiscal problem today with paying what we're paying now. So we'd have to really get ultimately at the, the, the bigger issue, which is restructuring the way we raise revenue in this state. So we're able to meet our obligations, not simply defer them. Um, another option that's been put out there is to try and have some kind of partial buyout of the benefits of current employees before they would retire. The notion being that if you uh, give folks some kind of immediate upfront payment, maybe five, 75 cents on the dollar, uh, that's a way that the state could obtain savings. Um, one proposal that had been put out there by a, a member of the General Assembly, um, the th thought would be you could partially buy out your, your, your pension benefits and um, in doing some actuarial math on that, they thought that maybe 10% of participants would be interested in that proposal and it would save the state about $160 million um, based upon current pension payments of about $7 billion. So, you know, we're talking about proposals here that are gonna mitigate the problem. It's not gonna be a silver bullet and solve the problem. We're still gonna have to pay uh, the benefits that become due. We can help lessen the blow, but we're still gonna have to restructure the means of raising revenue in the state to meet our obligations. Um, and that's really the ultimate point, is that we got into this mess 
by not properly funding the pension systems because we've had a poorly designed revenue structure that has not uh, given us the revenue sources we need to meet our obligations. Um, there are two other proposals that are out there that are worth mentioning. I don't, uh, I don't consider these to be viable options. Uh, the first proposal would be to allow municipalities to file for Chapter 9 bankruptcy to discharge their pension obligations through a bankruptcy court approved plan. The second proposal is to amend the pension clause to permit the General Assembly to unilaterally cut uh, pension benefits of current employees on a going forward basis. As I mentioned, I don't think either of these uh, proposals are uh, legally viable. House Bill 4427 is the proposal that would allow municipalities to file for Chapter 9 bankruptcy. And the proposal is really inspired by what had taken in place in Detroit, where the Detroit bankruptcy, and they have a similar pension clause in the Michigan Constitution, uh, and the court, the bankruptcy court in Detroit, finding that that provision of the Constitution did not act as an obstacle to allow Detroit and its emergency manager to cut the pension benefits in that state. Um, and the supporters of having Chapter 9 bankruptcy in Illinois see that this is another way, at least perhaps to put some pressure on labor unions to come to the table and bargain, but others to perhaps have this as a way to uh, protect bondholders and really allow unilateral cuts in pension benefits at the local level. And really the pressure point is that, that we have here is the fact that downstate communities, suburban communities uh, have to contribute uh, to IMRF and they also have to contribute to their downstate and police pension systems. And through the state legislation, there's intercept language that if there's money destined for those local communities from the state, those monies can be intercepted and uh, diverted into the local public pension plans. Um, there's been a lot of hearings over the last year about Chapter 9 uh, bankruptcy, um, and I've been spending, unfortunately, this becoming sort of a new mistress for me, much like pensions has been a mistress, according to my wife, since 2011, um, where I've looked at Chapter 9 of the Bankruptcy Code, I've looked at its legislative history, I've looked at uh, many of its decisions, and um, I'm just not convinced that this is even a viable option. And it really boils down to this. In order for an Illinois municipality to get into federal bankruptcy court, the, the federal bankruptcy code, Congress, requires the state of Illinois to pass a valid state law authorizing its municipalities to get into bankruptcy court. And the Illinois Supreme Court decisions that have come down recently have made it abundantly clear that the legislature simply lacks the legal state law power to pass a statute that will result in the unilateral reduction of pension benefits. And um, this is not something that they had to confront in Detroit nor in California when they were dealing with pensions because it was understood that the pensions that were protected in those states had no better protection than uh, what you would have for a contract under the federal co contract laws. The Illinois Supreme Court made it clear that there is elevated protection for public pensions when it comes to public pension benefits in Illinois. That was not a legal issue that they had to confront in Detroit or Calif uh, California. So those cases, I think, are uh, of interest, but they're not of any controlling interest, of course, in Illinois. Um, the final proposal is something that's been um, sought by the Civic Federation of Chicago. Their proposal would be to amend Article 13, Section 5, the Pension Clause of the Illinois Constitution, to specifically write into it that the General Assembly could make unilateral cuts in pension benefits of current employees. Now, you know, there's some political hurdles in order to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot. 
First, the amendment would have to be adopted by three-fifths of uh, the members of the Senate and the House. Um, Senate Bill 1 uh, passed with barely uh, a majority in both the House and Senate, so having a, a much higher vote requirement, I think, uh, dictates that that would be a tall order to uh, have the necessary three-fifths vote of the legislature. Um, but it would also need to be ratified by the voters. And uh, the next opportunity to amend the Illinois Constitution would be 2018. There was a window to put amendments on the ballot uh, for the 2016 election, but that window closed uh, in early May of this year. So, but even assuming that you had these political hurdles overcome where you had a constitutional amendment on the ballot and the voters ratified it, I still believe you'd have a legal challenge in court that that pension amendment would be unconstitutional under the U.S. Constitution, and it specifically being violative of the takings clause of the U.S. Constitution and also what's known as the contract clause of the Constitution. So in closing, um, the state and the city of Chicago's pension obligations are undoubtedly opposing a daunting physical challenge and uh, things are clearly bad, but I just want to share with you a little history that, you know, they've actually been worse. Um, and I know that's hard to take, but just bear with me. In 1841, Illinois defaulted on its annual interest payments. It owed on $14 million in bonds that had been issued to build railroads and canals in this state. That debt was described as insurmountable because the state's annual interest payment was nearly $800,000. Back then, that was a lot of money. Um, but the state only collected about $98,000 a year in revenue. So we, they had $800,000 in interest payments to pay its bonds, but it only brought in about 100 grand a year to the state. Um, immigration into Illinois ceased because of the prospect of high taxation. Any real estate that was really in place already was difficult to sell. Um, unsurprisingly, there was a strong hue and cry by elected officials and the press alike to simply repudiate that debt, much like Michigan you know, had done in other states at that time. They repudiated their debt. Um, and it was really something that had a lot of political favor because the money was owed to people out of state. Why do we care, right? They're not our people. Well, obviously, the money is owed on pensions to people here. Uh, Illinois Governor Thomas Ford, who took office in 1842, rejected the call for repudiation, and he succeeded in forcing the state to assume its responsibilities and save the state's credit rating. Governor Ford did this by negotiating with the state's creditors to mitigate the debt that was owed and by imposing a special state property tax to repay the debt and also sold state property. Uh, we had a lot of state property that we had received from the federal government. We were early in our years as a state, so that's was the state would receive a share of the proceeds from the sale. This special tax was put into the Illinois Constitution in 1848. And we ultimately did not pay off these debts until the 1880s. But by 1846, when Ford left office, Illinois was no longer held in disrepute by other states and its creditors, and the state's population grew. So just like we had these insurmountable debts because of these internal improvement debt obligations that we had taken on, our pension obligations are not insurmountable. Okay, but what it is, is it's going to take a tremendous amount of political will in order to do something to help mitigate this problem. And ultimately, it's going to require the state to restructure the revenue uh, structure it has to raise revenue so it can meet its obligations. So those are my comments. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Anybody, do we have time for questions or? Okay. 
Sir, back of the room. In your opinion, is the 3% automatic annual increase protected by the Constitution or can it be altered? It is protected by the Constitution. The uh, Senate Bill 1 decision that came down in May of 15 makes that clear but it can be changed through contract principles. Yes, ma'am. Yes, In fact, I was asked about health care back in 2011, and I, I didn't have an answer at that time. And you're right, we do have an answer th to that now. We have the Canerva decision, which came down in uh, July of uh, 2014, which recognized that the, the pension premium, the premium subsidies on health care is recognized as a protected pension benefit because your membership, your, uh, by being a member, you have been able to obtain that benefit by being a member of the pension system. Um, I think there's a question. It's, I think it's clear that the premium subsidy is what has been recognized as a protected benefit. There's some question about there whether they can change unilaterally the deductibles and the co-payments. That is an unresolved legal issue. And in fact, when they were litigating the Canervit case, uh, in the trial court here in Sangamon County, one of the questions from the trial court judge was, uh, you're telling me that the premium subsidy is protected, but what about when it comes to the co-pays and deductibles? Can the state change those? And the answer from counsel on the plaintiff's side was yes. So, but that is a matter that would need to be litigated and it hasn't been at this point. Yes, sir. Yeah. What other kinds of considerations do you see that could be on the horizon? Right now you talk about kind of a consideration uh, for the COLA uh, versus salary increase, but there, there are other considerations that you might be able to think of. That's correct. You know, this is just one example of something that can be used as consideration. The, the way courts view consideration is that it, it, the one party is offering something of benefit to the other party, or it's going to be a detriment on the party making the offer, okay? And really, that, that can be a whole host of things. It could be a cash payout. It could be uh, some kind of job protection. You know, it, there's a whole host of things. But in light of the fact that we do have collective bargaining in this state, a lot of those, those things about keeping your job and not being fired for cause, a lot of those things are already locked in through the collective bargaining process. So you'd have to find something that's really not captured by that as being a value uh, from uh, that standpoint. I hope that answers your question. Well, yeah, I mean, conceivably, we could say, okay, current employees, you need to pay a little bit more into your pension fund for blank, 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 I don't know. Well, in the past, when they've done some benefit increases, they have, raise the contribution rate at the same time that they pass that legislation. And that makes sense because you're getting something new. Rather than you just keep working as is, we want you to also give a half a percent of more of salary. They can do that, but if, if it's the issue of just staying where you're at, at your level of benefit, but unilaterally increasing your no, that, 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 I don't think that would square with the Constitution. Yes, ma'am. I can understand consideration for current employees. Mm -hmm. Can you think of anything at all for someone who's retired and is now already receiving pensions and health insurance benefits? Well, it, it goes back to uh, her question earlier, was what discretion does the state have to utilize some changes in co-pays and deductibles health. on health care. 
off the top of my head, that would be one. There might be others. I mean, if the state were flush with cash, of course, it could try and provide some kind of buyout. Uh, but we, we know we're in a precarious fiscal situation, and that's not on the horizon. One more question. Yes, sir. About 95% of my career, we were allowed to have two years of unused sick day to be used for retirement mm -hmm. just before I was about to retire. Jay made a decision that it would be one year. Considering the Supreme Court decision, is there any way we can get that one year back? Um, I'm not familiar with the context, so I wouldn't try and hazard a guess. Um, if, if, it's, if it's been part of the regime that the, the uh, uh, sick, sick time is a little bit different um, because you accrue sick time and that doesn't lock in stone the ability to change the future accrual of the sick time, uh, in, arguably. Uh, I, I just wouldn't want to hazard a guess. I would need to know more. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for the opportunity.